Yeah, machine is a very general term. I mean, the machine might be a mantra, a drug, uh, a, 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 a physical position. This is the kind of stuff we were playing with at La Cherera. But I don't, I'm, I'm now afraid of it because I know that it's real. You, ha- you have to believe you're going to fail to attempt to build a time machine because no one in their right mind, if they thought it was going to work, would in fact climb into the gleaming saddle and slam the lever forward. You have to believe that you're going to fail or you wouldn't do that. I had a particular um, psychedelic journey where I was going into the wormholes and, and I was realizing, wow, if people really are serious about doing this, this is the way, because I, I was actually feeling like I was able to go wherever I wanted. But at that moment, I refrained because, well, wow, this is real. I can actually traverse through you know, the timeless singularities or the timeless wormholes and pop out at any point in space-time because it's all interconnected at that one point. The name of the game is to bring back real information. I mean, that's how you will convince the rest of us to do it and to believe you. And I think it can be done. I think probably shamanism is about this. (coughs) But, you know, I really, like, one of the things we talked about a little bit here, but maybe not enough, is this bell non-local information space that seems to lurk beneath the surface of ordinary reality. For 50 years in quantum physics, this was denied as so counterintuitive and leading to such bizarre conclusions and possibilities that it must be impossible. And now they've done experiments that pretty much show this is real. This is real. And what it means is all the mystics of history were right. You can journey from any place in the universe to any other place instantly. You can extract information that lies on the other side of the cosmos instantly. It's all done in the imagination. The imagination is this sense which you have that is your non-local perceptor. Your local perceptors are your eyes, your ears, the surface of your body, so forth. The non-local perceptor is the imagination. And it's giving you a continuous holographic readout of the bell non-local dimension. And then, and it's like a, it's like a cheat on your being trapped in in the evolutionary cul-de-sac of Newtonian space and time. You are trapped in the evolutionary cul-de-sac of Newtonian space and time, but you have this little tiny peephole, this doorway, into the entire cosmos, all the races that ever were there, all the catastrophes and civilizations and philosophies and messiahs and so forth and so on. And it, But you have to, like, tune it. of this bell information is utterly incomprehensible to the human mind because it's on a scale too large or too small or it involves premises or environments or presuppositions so bizarre that we can't grok them. But the remaining 0.000001% of this data is absolutely fascinating. Beings, philosophies, works of art, ruins, planets, hierophanies, strange music, strange art, strange ideas, endlessly to be explored and then to be brought back as much as can be to the human camp and examined. I mean, we are hunters and gatherers in hyperspace as much as we are in in 3D, and what we're roving and scanning for in those informational spaces is things which delight us or make life more comfortable or inform our relationship to each other or our uh, environment. The future lies in the imagination. You know, the imagination is going to get louder and louder and louder. William Blake saw this. 
we talk about virtual realities, designer drugs, downloading ourselves into circuitry, travel through time, disincarnate bodies, cloned identities, gender shifting, point of view shifting, uh, all of these things. This is all about the rules of mind overwhelming the rules of physics. The rules of physics say, you know, you are a body, you are on a planet, you have weight, you have momentum, you have specific gravity, you must behave like this and like this and like this. And mind says, no, I want to be pure, unleashed conceptuality. I want to be a thought blown in a hyperdimensional wind. I want to move from planet to planet with the twink of an eye. I want to know everything, see everything, be everything, feel everything. And then by that means, somehow, I will make my way back to my higher and hidden source. And who knows, you know, maybe this always awaited us beyond the grave, and what we're doing in some sense is drawing death into the world and erasing that most profound of all boundaries distinctions. The distinction between life and death itself becomes thin, becomes transparent uh, in these contexts. I mean, I, it's very easy to imagine technologies such that human identity will be scrambled beyond imagining. You know, if you can download yourself into circuitry, you can uh, make copies of yourself. If you can make copies of yourself, you can collage these copies and make selves that never were or might have been. You can have multiple identities. Uh, in one of Greg Egan's stories, people have this thing inside them that is implanted when you're two years old that's called, it was, it starts out being called the dual and it ends up being called the jewel. And what it is, is it's a thing which simply maps and studies your nervous system and creates a perfect copy in silicone of, of your being for the first 23 years of your life. Well, then when you're 23, you go through this ceremony where the body is vaporized and the dual, this eternal copy of your youthful self, lives on. Uh, this is, you know, within reach. Uh, Hans Moravik had the idea that you could take, uh, you could nano-engineer bacteria such that they, uh, you could nanotechnologically engineer a leprosy bacteria because leprosy moves along the nerves from at the point of infection. Uh, a bacteria that would lay down uh, a thin wire of molecular gold along every nerve and so you would undergo these operations where you would slowly be changed into a thing of gold and silicon, glass and arsenic. But there would be no moment of transition, no loss of consciousness, no speed bump, no transition of identity. It's just over time you would become something completely eternal and machine-like. You know that poem by William Butler Yeats? sailing to Byzantium, where he says, Once out of nature I would be a thing of gold and gold enameling, set before the lords and ladies of Byzantium to sing of what was and what will be. Once out of nature, what he means is when I am dead, I will be a thing of gold and gold enameling. There's the image of the flying saucer coming out of the collective unconscious. We want to become the stone. We want to become somehow a living thing that is nevertheless has the character of machinery and objectification. It's a very complex image in the human mind, uh, you know, with Christ at one end of the spectrum and the universal medicine of longevity at the other end of the spectrum and then all these adumbrations and resonances the philosopher's stone, the grail the gift difficult to obtain the magical object the talking stick the, the jeweled self revealing basketballs of the DMT state you know, in the 53rd fragment of Heraclitus, he says, the aeon 
is a child at play with colored balls in eternity. And, you know, this makes no sense until you smoke DMT and then you find yourself in the presence of the aeon, the archon of the world age. It's a child at play with colored balls in some kind of a, of a virtual reality. Yeah. Um, I have two questions before the whole workshop ends up. But one of them is if you could talk a little bit about the tone that you and Dennis use to intercalate... Um, uh, tryptamine molecules and DNA, how you decide to use it, that particular tone, if it's occurred again in your life, what it may mean to you, um, as well as uh, just a brief comment on uh, gender ratios in your workshops, whether there's more men than women usually. You've talked a little bit about that before. I've heard you say that men may be more drawn toward the psychedelic experience because of some lack of uh, intuitive knowledge about uh, Yeah, well, I don't know why exactly it is. It certainly seems true that men have a deeper relationship to drugs than women. I think that's generally true. Even hard drugs, women don't seem uh, as interested in drugs or as potentially addicted to drugs. Maybe there's a deeper survival instinct there. Women are constantly burying the dead, caring for the sick, giving birth, helping with miscarriages. Uh, They may be more rock-bottom realists. Well, you know, the guys are harping 100,000-line oral epics and uh, stuff like that. I think, you know, the I quoted this statistic in a different context, but that in 1800, the average American woman gave birth 13 times. Uh, Giving birth, especially in a world without anesthetic, is a pretty psychedelic and boundary-dissolving and ego-erasing and whoop-de-doo kind of experience. I think women may, in traditional societies, not care to contextualize psychedelics simply because they have enough on their hands. Um, I don't know the gender, you know, there's a lot about gender stuff I'm interested in, but I don't understand. My friend Brenda Laurel work studies girls and why they seem to have some difficulty naturally acclimating to the internet and how boy and girl, male-female mathematical abilities seem to differ, although I think that's changing. I think the latest data is that women are pulling even with men in mathematical graduate schools, uh, at least in some places. Uh, I don't know. Men are, uh, and maybe this is cultural or maybe this is biological, but men are maybe more boundary-defined than women. Like women seem, and again, You make these statements, you don't know whether you're making a biological statement or a cultural statement, but women seem more tolerant of bisexual and homosexual behavior. They're sort of comfortable with all that, where man, male, male sexual encounters are always defined to some degree by uh, uh, competitiveness or, you know, the hidden shadow of competition. now, what was the other part of your, your question? Oh, about the tone. About the tone. Well, this is a very specific question, but in the story that's told in The Invisible Landscape, Dennis seemed, as he went around the bend, to have insights into these, like, shamanic techniques that were real techniques and that he could not only tell you what they were, he could tell you how they worked. And one of the things he insisted upon was that you could use your voice to transduce energy into your own body and other people's bodies, which this is no news. Acoustical signals are a good way to transduce energy across space. But that you could actually use it almost like a acoustical laser or something like that, and that you could interfere with the normal chemistry of these drug molecules and make them uh, enter into bonding situations that they would normally not be have affinity for the bond. You do this by making them superconductive. 
you make them superconductive by stilling their molecular motion. We tend to think of absolute zero as a temperature, but in fact, when an atom is still, from a physicist's point of view, it's at absolute zero. At absolute zero, the normal rules of bonding are canceled, and these things become like sticky. They'll bond to anything. And so he said you could use voice to form a relationship of the geometric incident of the angle of attack of the incoming acoustical wave as it encountered the molecular matrix, that it would cause some of these molecules to become superconducting, and that then they would bond permanently into the into the bond site of activity, and that instead of having a transient psychedelic trip, you would lock this stuff in, and he envisioned the harmine molecule, which has these two Mickey Mouse-like ears of, of benzene rings hanging off the pentaxial structure of the center. He visualized them like vibrating antenna. And he said, you know, you will land these molecules into the nuclear cleft of the DNA and then bond them in with this acoustically generated sound. And then forever after the person that we do this to will have a standing waveform holographic image in their imagination of their of the sum total of space and time. It was like he he said, you know, you'll get this image of the universe that will be sort of like your interface to the big internet. You know, the internet where every star is a website. And uh, and he and the sound that you were to make to cause this to happen was the electrons, a, an octave or a harmonic. I'm sorry, a harmonic of the electron spin resonance of the harmine molecule in your system. And it is true that when that a significant percentage of the people who take ayahuasca report a loud hum. A hum it was a hum, and uh, and so he felt that by imitating these molecular hums and tuning through them, that you 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 only, according to him, you only had to make the right sound for a few milliseconds. So the the going the doing the scales was an effort to hit all possible sounds, knowing that when you got it right for just a few milliseconds, it would lock in. And so these sounds sounded somewhat like this. And then he somehow was able to keep going, and then he would start over and do this, and he called this the strum, and it would not have been worth talking about 32 years later or whatever, except that it seemed to work. It it caused him to go spectacularly bananas, and me to go arguably nearly as spectacularly bananas, and in a way, you know, that trip we've never come down from. I mean, I'm not saying that as I sit here I am in contact uh, with the eschaton or the, the the spinning violet torus of hyperdimensionally stored holographic information. But on the other hand, I feel uh, I feel a very strange, weird connection to those times. Probably because he put all kinds of strange suggestions into my mind. I mean, at one point he said. You know we can never leave this place. We'll never leave this place. He said, but we have to fashion an image and send it forth. We have to send forth holographic images of ourselves. And I've often wondered, you know, am I still down there, rising at dawn to walk the grassy pasture loaded out of my skull? And, you know, this is all some sort of... Solid.